there's no question that the United States is poised for an onshoring manufacturing renaissance. Can you imagine what a juggernaut that would be between Canada, the United States, and Mexico if everyone could get their act in order? It just seems like such a win-win. Welcome to the Day 2 Podcast. Today's episode, with the global chaos curve trending upward and to the right, what should product brands do to adjust, protect, and prepare their brands for more nuttiness? I'm Jason Boyce, founder and CEO of Avenue 7 Media and host of the Day 2 Podcast. With me today is a friend of Day 2, Steve Simonson, global entrepreneur and all-around great guy. Steve is the founder of the e-commerce association Empowery.com and offers free, that's right, free entrepreneurial support via his website and podcast platform, awesomers.com. Well, Steve, you're awesome. So it makes sense that you came up with awesomers.com. Thanks for joining us again. How in the heck have you been? Gosh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm well, and I was glad to, glad to see you. I'm, I am glad to see you and, and indeed uh, back on the day two podcast. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Steve. I, you know, we got to connect a little bit Excel, at Accelerate. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. But always a pleasure to have you on the show and to talk about your amazing insights. So let's let's dive in. She and Biden are sparring. India flexes its muscles. The Chinese economy is imploding or exploding, however you want to look at it. There's war not only in Ukraine, but now in the Middle East. Even India and Canada... Two friendly democracies are at each other's throats. Steve, what the hell is going on? Temperatures are boiling over everywhere. What does this mean? What does this mean for small business and sellers? It does feel like madness, right? It, it is the sky is uh, falling would be an understatement. It, it, you know, depends on who you ask, I guess. You know, there's this this concept of deglobalization has been talked about, you know, for the last few years, specifically as it relates to uh, China and the United States and kind of the the tensions and geopolitical this and who's going to pass who and total GDP, those types of, uh, they're, they're almost academic or philosophical conversations, right? And people can argue about them and they can have their opinion about this and data point about that. But at, at the end of the day, it doesn't come down to real stuff until you see this kind of crazy kinetic action, right? People are shooting at each other and, and atrocities abound. The truth is, I don't think it's the, the last of the problems. I, I think it's just beginning. Uh, two years ago, I gave a, a a breakdown of how I see the the situation, not just in China, but kind of the the deglobalization happening and, and kinetic action, which is a nicer way to say wars. Uh, that's going to be a theme. And it's a theme because the United States is kind of stepping away from the the cop on the beat, if you will, and you know that reality, I suppose, right? There, there's no denying that some of that is happening, and you can argue about how much or how much more, but it's it's going to have an impact on not just global trade, but you know geopolitics and just our general ability to do the things we did five years ago. It's it's a different world, and that's that is unequivocally true. There's no doubt about it. I mean, China, for example. When we, in my previous life as a seller, when we first went to China, there was no question that things were just going to continue to get better. And they did every year for a decade while I was going over there, talking to factories, developing products, getting them sourced and everything. Now, I'm not so sure. In fact, Steve, we were, we were talking at Accelerate and I saw you holding court at a table as you tend to do with these young sellers, giving them some of your amazing knowledge. And I sat down and the topic kind of switched to this story that we both know about where China isn't letting everyone who visits come home. Cue the Hotel California music song. What are your thoughts on this? Do you know of any specific examples of anyone you know that's traveling over there where this has happened to them? Um, this is a real concern. Well, luckily, it has not yet impacted anybody I know firsthand, but it is a reality. So China passed a... Uh, a new law essentially saying that, hey, we can detain anybody for any reason at any time. And in particular, we're going to be running some some spy checks on Westerners or foreigners in general as they depart the country. So, you know, it used to be, hey, come on in, drop off a, a bag of money and, and give us a bunch of POs and then, you know, leave, do whatever you're going to do and then come back. Uh, 
we don't really look at foreigners the same way we look at, at China in terms of domestic turmoil or things like that. But it's almost like uh, China is now creating a credit score for for every foreign person too. So they have the internal China, you know, so-called social credit score, which is diabolical to say the least. And uh, there's no reason to believe that we're not on that. In fact, one of the top law firms in, uh, I would say, the space of China, but geopolitics itself, uh, Harris Bricken, they have had more business in this kind of risk assessment, this specific topic than they've ever had before. And the the truth is, given some of the the criticism I've had about politics or the party, you know, I, I'm a big fan of China. I've been going there for decades and I, you know, I love the people and historically have loved the food and so forth, but I, I it's too risky for me to go now. Like the, this U.S. State Department basically said, don't go, you shouldn't go. Like not just to me, to the uh, Americans at large. So, you know, sellers are not paying attention. They're like, well, it's a Canton Fair. How am I supposed to not go? And I'm like, well, you know, fair enough. I'm not going. And here's why. Now, one safety mechanism is don't speak your mind, have no opinions, do as you're told. Um, if they talk about Xinjiang, you say, yay, uh, let's go, you know, um, re-education camps or genocide, right? Uh, that, that's, you have to get on their team or else. And I, like, I, I can't imagine that I'll ever return to China at this stage. No, I, I totally agree, Steve. I'm reminded of a story I was in, Shanghai hotel and I had just had a terrible meeting with the factory and I was furious and I was just I was talking to my dad on my cell phone and uh, actually through my computer I think it was Skype at the time and I was just teeing off on China in general and at some point my dad said Jay stop that you're in you're in freaking China you know be quiet I'm like oh it's fine I didn't have any worries about even then complaining and now now this was a while ago this was a decade ago but I can never imagine doing that now. You've got to know if you're a seller, the minute you cross the border into China, and frankly, when you arrive at the Hong Kong airport now, you got to know that they're tracking your every move. They can hear your phone conversations. They can track and see all of your internet conversations. That is a great piece of advice, Steve, to be able to come home. Don't talk bad. If you're going to do anything, talk positively about everything the Chinese government stands for. Because if you don't, you may not get to leave. Yeah, not just in China. Like they are literally, you know, patrolling social media. They will have podcasts like these, you know, kind of transcribed and assigned to the appropriate parties. And that may sound, you know, Orwellian or superstitious or what have you. But I of that, I am certain like a, there's no question that they're gathering the data and they're picking, um, you know, you're, you're basically put on one side or the other and you're with us or against us. And the problem is the CCP's maniacal need to stay in control supersedes their own people's well-being. Like, uh, even though China gave us the impression that they're building up and, you know, all these people out of poverty, there was a bunch of hocus pocus that went along with that math. And it turns out it's not really true in the same way we took the story in. The narratives that we were fed for two decades plus were not always, well, seldom if ever accurate now there there's always pieces of the story you've been to shanghai i've been to shanghai you know some of these cities are have a spectacular appearance to them and there was a time where this was i would say quite real but today tofu dreg is the common construction practice uh there are high rises you know that shake and people wonder if they're going to fall over there are bridges that collapse there are roads that just suddenly implode and you know cars fall into them so this idea of everybody uh, kind of looking out for themselves is pervasive. And so, you know, I, I definitely am more nervous about the stability of the system uh, than I used to be. Certainly, you know, I wish I could go back to 2019, but that's not how it is. Yeah, no, I, I agree. In fact, I had a conversation with Anne recently, my wife, and I was like, well, she's saying it'd be cool to see the Great Wall. I said, I, I'm not going to go to China probably ever again until something changes drastically there. I think that's good advice, Steve. You know, folks figured out how to make China work during COVID without traveling there. My advice, unless you absolutely must go, I wouldn't go. And if you do, listen to Steve. I certainly am not going. And yeah, if you do go, you never, and I mean never, not at home, not, you know, on social media, like your phone could be recording this stuff. This may sound like I'm a crazy conspiracy guy, but believe me, when I start to see some of the pieces put together, 
you know, if you have TikTok on your phone, assume they're listening to everything. So all of that is like folder all for, you know, the, the Twitter scape and the conspiracy nuts. But the truth is, it's very simple. Like China is really good at manufacturing stuff because they have all this sunk cost, all this investment. And they've been losing a bunch of business. So how do these things exist at the same time? Like they, they have this commanding position in global manufacturing, but they're losing business, right? If you look at some of the port activities or many of the economic reports, uh, they're down significantly. One could argue there's macroeconomics, you know, if things are slowing down in this country or that country, but it's, it's definitely happening. And so I think sellers, there will be a great temptation, you know, between now and the, let's say the end of China. At some point, there will be an end of being able to buy from China. And it could be geopolitically induced. It could be cost. It could be alternative. And like there's any number of reasons. But yeah, I, you know, I, there's a lot of people who speculate that the CCP will have a hard time being in business in 10 years. At some point, there will be a disruption. Let's just uh, say that. And then, but the right now is this weird little opportunity gap between you're completely screwed and why would you look for an alternative? Because it's cheaper, faster, more known. Like it, there's never been a better time to buy than now. So it's extraordinarily tempting to just say, well, I'll just stay with, you know, the guy I'm, you know, or the gal that I've used for all these years instead of looking for alternatives, which is cost more and takes longer. So it is a very difficult choice for people. But I can tell you, there is a, there's a fuse burning on this thing and it is not going to last forever. And I'll sound nutty right up until the point where they go, oh, he was right. Now it might be a year, might be five years, but there's no doubt that there's a storm coming. Don't worry, Steve, we've got the recordings and when it happens, we'll have you back on. <laughs> Fair uh, enough. Yeah, I'll be here. <laughs> you know, what, what other kind of Orwellian craziness? I mean, that story of visitors not being able to leave was terrifying to me. It ran shivers down my spine and solidified what you just said. I ain't going back there, not under the current regime for sure. What other kind of nuttiness are you seeing and craziness out of China? I, I'm reminded of what you said in the last podcast, Steve, and I'm still floored by it. I had no idea that China had more debt than the US and EU combined. I had no idea. And that's got to be funding a lot of these facades that you were talking about. And that house of cards, like you're saying, has got to crumble. But what else are you seeing that is evidence of the inevitable as this fuse gets shorter and shorter in China? Well, this is one of those things that, you know, I, I don't listen to what people say. You know, I like to see what they do. And what what they're doing is any number of just weird things. So in China, you, you hear a lot of people talk about, hey, the, the EVs, you know, they call them NEVs, right? Uh, this, these new cars, China's going to export to the world. It's going to be amazing. And, and why shouldn't they? They're the manufacturing capital. And now they figured out how to make them and so on. And listen, that's for sure happening. Uh, at the German auto show here recently, the majority of display, you know, makers were, uh, were China. owned. there, there are over a hundred NEV companies, right? Electronic vehicle companies. So, but there are many videos, and you can search this on YouTube, of these cars just just uh, combusting, right? It's just like, oh, no, that's on fire now. It's crazy, yeah. It, it's, it is just weird to watch these cars. Now, for those of you Amazon sellers who remember the little uh, hoverboards, well, if, if they can't make a hoverboard, what makes you think they can make a full automobile in a predictable way? And I should tell you that I used to do a bunch of lithium-ion, and the reason I stopped doing it was because we paid a bunch of extra money and a bunch of extra engineering to make battery packs, essentially, that would not explode or smoke, even if they were were damaged. Like, even if you had an impact, like, just say, a, you know, something stabbed that middle of that battery pack, we didn't want our thing to cause a fire. Yeah. Because we're like, if it's at their house or they're on an airplane or any number of problems, right? But there's no way we can compete with the guys who are like, who gives a crap? Right. Yeah. Right. And so uh, we have many videos of the, the different examples of those. But anyway, so these these cars and sometimes they're buses, sometimes they're fire trucks in a huge twist of irony are catching <laughs> on fire. Yeah. How do you how does a fire truck put out the fire truck? So that's one little thing. There's another thing that, you know, people talk about. In fact, Charlie Munger, if you're listening, uh, you're you're very convinced that BYD is the, uh, you know, the ultimate investment. 
And I guarantee you, not only are they cooking the books, but it is not even close in terms of engineering to Tesla. And uh, one example I would share is they had a bunch of ride, uh, ride sharing is a wrong word, a bunch of companies in China that would allow you to kind of just rent the vehicle. It would be like those scooter rentals you see all over Austin, Texas, right? And you just, you just scan and you take the car or whatever. Well, eventually when cheap money went away, all of those things went broke. There are now hundreds of thousands of cars sitting in fields, just rotting away. And again, these many, many videos are examples of this. So, you know, the symptom of, you know, they're going to take over the world. First, I question the engineering as I watch these things explode. And second, I question their sales as I see, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of cars just sitting in fields. It's uh, amazing. See, I've, I've often wondered that. Of course, Charlie Munger, longtime partner of uh, Warren Buffett. And I've seen Warren Buffett get on stage and talk about how great of an investment BYD is. And I've often asked the same question. You know, you and I have had these discussions on the fishing boat, et cetera. There's no way I trust any number that the Chinese government puts out there. You can at least subtract 30% if it's a positive number, maybe more. And yeah, so I, I would tell you, you know, uh, firsthand, you know, uh, watching some books getting cooked, uh, that would be a severe understatement. Uh, is my guess. And, and again, I have, I have no firsthand info of BYD, but I can tell you that I wouldn't trust that for a minute. Not In fact, for two years, I've been saying, why in the world would you send your money to a Chinese investment when you're watching the property market collapse just in the last two weeks? Country Garden has basically admitted that they're insolvent. Uh, this is a government-owned property company already on the heels of Evergrande, which declared chapter 15 in the US. And, you know, their sales are almost non-existent. They're, they're, they're all propped up by fake local cities and, and counties and provinces creating fake companies to buy whatever is being sold. So that it's not even real. So uh, that those are things. Now, some funner ones are more interesting maybe to the audience. Like there are a bunch of guys paint their pigs black. And why would you paint your pig black? Well, you know, you got this big fat pig, but black pigs sell for more because they're from a different area. They're more tender or whatever. So there's guys literally on camera, they're painting their pigs black so they get more at market or painting their red chili peppers more red so they get a better price or painting bushes or street sides green so to look like they're environmentally friendly. And you know that paint's got lead in it, by the way. <laughs> oh, at, at best. That is the, that's the friendly version. There are guys, uh, there's an old sentiment. I don't know if you guys have heard this, but many Amazon sellers in particular would think that, you know, Black Hat was invented to to game Amazon, but it wasn't. Uh, oh, it happened long before Amazon. Yeah. The, the uh, old Chinese proverb uh, basically translated to English says, if you can cheat, then cheat, right? And, and so the guys selling cardboard will, will, you know, make it a little bit more damp because they sell it by the pound. And the guys who get subsidies to build toilets or escalators or plant cotton will fake their way through it. And all of these are just kind of like gaming the system so they can get whatever subsidy, whatever money exists. But this is this is why they have so much debt. People are like, if they have trade surpluses, how can they have debt? And this is one of the reasons. If you spend billions and billions of dollars on roadways that collapse or escalators, literally escalators that go nowhere, like it just goes up a hill to nothing, or rocks that are painted white on the top and have rebar on the bottom and, and that's supposed to be a, a cotton field like these are the kind of crazy things so that kind of stuff is just like really weird and it, to me it points at this is a chaotic place not to be trusted and so when you're like well I'm, I'm getting my toys made there and I want to make sure the paint's right or I'm getting my furniture done i want to make sure there's no formaldehyde like you better be extra extra careful and full disclosure we still have some stuff made in china if we can move it out we will and again i've sold most of those companies so I, it's just kind of a you know i have some supply chain responsibilities for a couple of years but it's it's difficult and we are maniacally focused on making sure we don't get cheated and, and i hope that we don't get cheated well i've been there uh and i've seen it and you know, I've, I've even hired QA companies who are all on the take yeah. and didn't, you know, I still had bad stuff arrive to the point where, uh, you know, before I exited my company, I had my own Q, QC team on the ground because I didn't trust anyone else, even the people that Walmart were using. Right. So it, 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 it really paints a, a stark picture, Steve. And I think you're, 
you're dead on. I agree with you. For all of you brands and sellers who are listening and viewing this podcast on on YouTube or wherever else you listen to your podcasts, you have got to be thinking about plan B. Fine, get a few more orders in, but it is coming. Steve is right. You may think he's wearing a tin hat. He is not. This is absolutely happening. So let's talk about that. So let's talk about some of the big categories. You know, electronics is big in China. Textiles is still big in China, especially some of those synthetic materials, furniture, metal products. Where should brands be thinking about going instead of China to begin building those relationships, Steve? There is no one single replacement for China, right? You can't take a billion plus people and go, all right, where's that other billion plus people? The only one that is is in that caliber is India. And they're they have very low interest in exporting. The percent of companies in India that give a crap about exporting is extremely low. Now, that's why? both good and bad for India. Do you say why? Yeah, yeah. Why wouldn't they want to export? That seems like a win-win for their populace. Well, it's a, it's a fair question. Like in 1982, China and India had about the same GDP. Today, nowhere close, right? And so one could say, well, gosh, you know, wh- why did India miss the boat? And why won't they grab on the boat now? The truth appears to me that they just want to be mostly self-sustained. Like they don't want to have to import. They don't want to have to export and rely on outsiders for their own survival. And that has served them relatively well. It keeps them, you know, they, they still have to import energy, but not nearly as much as China. And they can get it from the Middle East way easier than China. China is extraordinarily dependent on the outside world. These are weaknesses. Uh, so anyway, population-wise, India has a shot, but skills-wise, infrastructure-wise, manufacturing-base-wise, not really. So they're a tech hub, they're a service hub. They're not really a manufacturing hub in any meaningful way. Yeah, there are plenty of things that I can get made in India, including some metalworks, including, you know, handmade stuff, furniture, even so, uh, one of the best factories I've seen anywhere in the world was in India for a plastics type of product. So it, it, it exists, but it's just really hard to find and it's, it's uh, you know, just takes longer. So, but Vietnam is clearly the, the hands down alternative, but they're a fraction of China. You know, you're talking 100, 120 million people, 110 million. I don't remember exactly the number. So, and they do excellent textiles. They do a lot of uh, different things. The, some electronics, Thailand, I would say, is a little better electronics. Singapore uh, can connect to electronics. What you really have to do is you have to look at the raw materials and you get as close as you can to that raw material source and then look at all the sub assemblies. I do think that there will be an ongoing shift, uh, you know, to Vietnam. And somebody ran a, a recent study. I, I, I'll try to remember to send you this and you can take a look at it. But basically, it, it on a two-month lag for imports into Vietnam and then exports from Vietnam, it is extraordinarily high correlation between stuff they're getting from China and then is shipped out to the United States or at least outside of, of Vietnam. Now, we, now, are we talking supplies or finished goods? They're bringing them from China into Vietnam and then shipping them to the United we're, States? In this or case, or we're both? just looking at the value of the products. Okay, I believe that's it. the case, yeah. So, so, so China really is their supply chain for the parts question. and everything. Yeah. And why wouldn't it be, right? If you can yeah. get the, the raw materials right across the street and they're already making it. Now, there are plenty of, I've been to factories in Vietnam that literally have their own you know, components are getting, you know, you know, whatever it is, either locally or from sources outside of China. And by the way, there's a big risk. I know several public companies right now who have their containers held in customs because their product ended up being traced back to Xinjiang region. The United States has a law called the Uyghur Force Labor Protection Act, the UFLPA. And that enforcement has begun, I would say, in the last 12 months. And it is very complex in how you maintain compliance and the way you declare that, you know, you've done all the things correctly. This includes every aspect of the supply chain. And of course, it's no surprise to sellers that, you know, Photoshop works. And so they can make documents look like whatever they want. But U.S. Customs is running chemical tests. And they're running chemical tests, not just on products made in China or made where they think it has a risk, but also made in Vietnam. And so customs is in Vietnam running chemical tests to see, 
did this cotton or did this plastic originate from Xinjiang? And of course, the Uyghurs, an ethnic minority in China, who in China has been accused uh, and evidence has been shown of uh, potential genocide or uh, certainly a mass conversion away from their standard culture to more of a communist culture. And in many ways, what you're referencing is the U.S. government trying to passing a law to prevent some of the slave labor, essentially, that's coming out of that region where uh, the Uyghurs are. I thought we'd reach max max craziness, Steve, and then I almost all, totally forgot about the Uyghurs, right? And the mass genocide that uh, has been alleged in China. Yeah. The, so the U.S. officially, you know, Trump's last day of office, he declared the what's happening in Xinjiang is genocide. Biden's first day in office reinforced that declaration and said, "Yes, what's happening is genocide." So there's a morality question for all of us that go, "Why are we buying from China?" That's a question you can put on your own shelf and deal with it yourself. But there, there's now a uh, fundamental, functional question of, did my stuff originate? Did the raw materials originate? And, you know, these are things that, you know, China basically says, um, you know, they're, they can do whatever they want. It's an internal domestic issue. They're trying to, you know, get rid of extremism. But there are like a million to two million people, it's estimated, in these so-called re-education camps and and I, you know, I, I haven't been there firsthand. I've only seen reports. So what do I know? But it's it paints a picture of like, why in the world would we want to support that? And uh, that's a fair question. But my whole point is, instead of, you know, picking at that scab, which is real, like if you buy stuff in Vietnam and they get that stuff sourced from Xinjiang, even if you have all the fake Photoshop stuff, the chemical test can can prove origin. And U.S. Customs is running those tests. So you better get good and understanding your real supply chain. Like we have our people look at the physical bags, the receipts from the raw material suppliers, like all kinds of stuff before production. Holy crap. So back to what do you do about this, right? I know on the last episode, Steve, we were together, you mentioned the Asian nations, not necessarily Asia, A-S-E-A-N nation, Thailand, Malaysia, Cambodia. We talked about Vietnam. What has been your experience since our last conversation? How have those areas been in terms of picking up some of the slack as you try to diversify your supply chains out of China? Well, first, Vietnam has been uh, a critical linchpin. Uh, I have to say that, uh, particularly during COVID. Uh, I was in Vietnam not long ago. It's it's a bustling place. It's, it's interesting. It's uh, fun. I, I do think that they have a lot of upside. They, you know, still a communist country. Let's not kid ourselves. So sure. uh, there are, you know, potentially challenges, but they are the, they feel like the 20 year ago, you know, come on in, drop off your money. Let's uh, make sure you're happy and let's sell you as much as we possibly can. And there are, there are a bunch of different factory base, all ownership bases there. You know, there's some that are uh, China factories just rolling across the border and setting up camp. There are heavy Korean presence, especially in the South, and then the, the local Vietnamese-owned factories as well. So these different conglomerates have different um, you know options. But I think Vietnam is, has been really uh, resilient. Malaysia and Cambodia are really good if you're doing you know raw materials that require like wood products or other uh, you know rubber, you know things like that that are natural resources that are in those regions. So maybe furniture or those sure. kinds of yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Stop. cabinets, furniture, uh, all kinds of wooden-based types of things. I do think that Thailand and Vietnam, uh, South Korea, all good at electronics. They're getting you know much much better at electronics. India has you know I've got a really great factory that does metal and uh, those types of things, uh, finish work, you know, uh, all kinds of things. So like you can find those. But the the one thing that I haven't reinforced in this conversation is. The number one thing you can do if you're buying in China is get on terms. Get on terms. Everybody says, I don't know why they say this. I've heard gurus, you know, talking about this on, you know, Twitter or on stage. I watch them go, you know, you can't get terms from China. And I'm like, okay, well. Uh, I had terms. Yeah. You I, you terms. Know, I've bought on terms for years. I don't know. Uh, what they know that I don't, but you may not get it on the first quarter, but if you start to show a relationship and build it, you can't get that for sure. Yeah. And by the way, once you have enough of a history there, you can get it on the first order. It doesn't matter because you have a credit record with the, the state export insurance company called Sinosure. Like we will not 
in any significant volume, we would never place an order and put cash up front. Um, we, we check the, you know, very rigid about the supply chain, very rigid about production, pre-shipment inspection, and then the goods are physically here. So there's no risk financially that they will simply disappear and they're disappearing like crazy. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. Until this happens to you firsthand or until you see it happen firsthand, you may not understand it, but it is happening. The ba bankruptcy rate for small businesses is off the charts. And all this financial pressure with the housing and all these weird things I talk about, the black pigs and so forth, like all those are symptoms of people are getting more and more desperate for money and more and more concerned about their investments. And some people estimate that the the housing has been overbuilt by 20, 20 to 40 million units. So 20 to 40 million. So think about how many families would live. With a population that's shrinking. Correct. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so there are a whole, you know, we could do a whole episode about the the dynamics of the property situation, but all of those, like just imagine yourself, you're in the mind of a factory. If you don't think that you're going to have, you know, a retirement investment, or you think that, you know, you watch all these big companies getting beat down by the, the government for common prosperity, and you're like, well, gosh, maybe I'm not going to be able to keep my money. I better get as much as I can and get it out of here as quick as I can. And that, that leads to a lot of crazy behaviors. That makes perfect sense. If you're not looking for a long-term relationship because you're going out of business, let's get the money and run. Let's paint our chili peppers that are yellow, red, get top dollar and who care, and, and then erase my cell phone number, right? Yeah. Well, and you know, because it goes all the way down, one of the things I loved about going to China was all the great food and things like that. But the more you see people being desperate and using gutter oil and faking you know all these different foods i don't know if we talked about that in our last episode but no it, it, we didn't talk about fake foods it, the fake food epidemic is absolutely insane like i used to love and savor my opportunities to go eat uh food there and now you know like you just don't know what you're gonna get it's more risky and it's it's kind of well it's more than gross like when you see it you'll be like oh i'm never eating again <laughs> but uh without the context of seeing the video is hard to, to imagine, but let's just say that like all of these are little tiny indicators. And when they add up, they add up to chaos that I'm not willing to participate in any more than needed. And you know what comes to mind as you're talking about this, Steve, the fall of the Soviet Union, right? The paper tiger. Everyone thought they were so strong and so powerful and so rich that it was never going to end. And then all of a sudden like that, it was over. And you knew there were problems. There were food lines. There were supply issues. These government run companies where powerful politicians came in and sucked the juice out of those things to the point where they couldn't function anymore imploded one after the other and before you know it the fall of the soviet union happened yeah and 10 years earlier they were predicted to be passing the united states right a lot of similarities here right a lot of similarities uh there's a, a another key example you, you mentioned state-owned and and you know kind of the government kind of eating at the trough before anybody else the in china there used to be an old saying like if you want a stable life, you get an iron rice bowl job, right? This is a, a state, uh, county, city, some municipal, any kind of government work, basically. But it's it's very common that all of those salaries are now being cut. So if you're an administrative worker, your salary is being cut. Your bonuses are being canceled. There's a reports right now that in Kunming, which is a second tier city, that the metro people, the people working the subway system haven't been paid since may uh there's another case where the bus guys hadn't been paid in nine months these are government municipal jobs where's where's the money the interesting thing about that if you've got any kind of power or control over any sector as one of those local governments you're going to supplement your lost income and how are you going to do it you're going to bribe you're going to go and, and 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 take money away from from other folks so this is much Crazy. more of a shit show than i ever imagined steve i know it was bad when we last talked but my goodness it seems to be accelerating fast back to this idea of what can brands and sellers do to protect themselves against this there's no question that you must diversify now what about and we talked about some of the the asian nations thailand malaysia vietnam i've always questioned why philippines can't step in i mean they have a bigger population than the united states they have a very Western friendly culture, just some of the happiest people I've ever met culture wise. If I'm being a generalist here, they, you know, they've become sort of the back office of many Amazon seller businesses over the last decade. 
with no end in sight, really. What about the Philippines? Why can't or hasn't, in your mind, the Philippines nation become more of a manufacturing center? Well, a couple of things I want to say there. First, uh, there, in my humble opinion, I'm certainly open to being wrong, there's no way they have more people in the United States. I would say they have half as many as the U.S. Uh, they have half as many? Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Our that's right. U.S. is number three, right? So it's, yeah. it's India, China, who knows what that real number is, and then the United yeah. States. And then yeah. there's a bunch like Indonesia would probably be still ranking higher. But so there there are people there and no question they're culturally, you know, very excellent people, right? In in so many ways. And and this, you know, this is largely true, you know, wherever you go. The the challenge is like islands are not awesome for manufacturing hubs, right? <laughs> there's not a lot of train systems, there's not a lot of raw materials movement. And so you end up with these, you know, mountainous you know, surroundings and then cities kind of jammed in there. This is not a heavily manufacturing friendly area. There's also just, again, there's a history of, let's just call it the crab mentality. You know, somebody who was, you know, doing well and climbing up. Well, whether it's politicians or competitors or whatever, they, you know, kind of pull them back down to that crab uh, bucket with everybody else. So I, I don't know that they aspire to be a top tier exporter either. Their main export, honestly, is people, right? Yeah, and, and talent they and export labor. their yeah. people, uh, you know, either through, you know, BPO type of operations where they physically stay in the Philippines or, you know, uh, to foreign work. I, I just don't see Philippines being a major, major player unless it is things like, let's just call it coconut industry related or sure. tropical right. industry related. Or agricultural stuff. Yeah. yeah, things that they have distinct raw materials advantages. But that's the other thing. On an island, it doesn't matter if you're UK or Philippines, you don't have a ton of raw materials to deal with. And if you can't rail it or put it on a truck and drive it there and it's got to go on a boat or there's not bridges connecting all these archipelago, this archipelago together as one, I, I see what you're saying. That makes perfect sense to me. Even boats, uh, like, you know, boats could transport raw materials. It's just, you know, it's dangerous. And it's, you know, there's South China Sea conflicts with, you know, China and others. And sure. so- and there's and and there's a monsoon that blows through, and there's monsoon that blows through every thirty days. All right, so talk about dangerous. So it makes sense. Now, Jeff Wilkie, former head of global worldwide at Amazon, has been hitching his wagon to this whole idea of onshoring. You know, and I kind of throw Mexico in that boat a little bit. Onshoring. What about that possibility? Have you seen any movement in more manufacturing coming onshore and or at least uh, across our southern border in Mexico? Well. First, there's no question there will be a manufacturing renaissance in the United States. It's happening. That's happening. How it comes to, to bear, again, relates on uh, raw materials. I always tell people, you need three things. You need raw materials, you need power, and you need people to make stuff, right? So the U.S. has, and between U.S. and Canada, we have great raw materials. No question about that. We have power, no problem. And the things that we need to get to Mexico, like power, we do right? Uh, natural gas pipelines and the, and the like. So that makes Mexico, which is not great at raw materials, but now they got power and they got access to our raw materials relatively easy out of Canada and the U.S. And then you have the new, you know, NAFTA version 2.0, which is uh, the USMCA. The Trump version. Yeah. it's And it, it's not just better, it's way better. And it's actually better for Mexico, for example. So- uh, Canada came to the party late, and so their their deal got worse, but Mexico's got a lot better. And it's true that we need Mexico because they have a great high population of uh, talented, skilled labor. And people willing to work hard. People willing to roll up their sleeves and do manual labor and work. Many of them are trained and and higher level than the some of the non-value-add China labor. So they have a huge opportunity. But, you know, listen, the, the elephant in the room is the cartel. The cartels are in control of many of those border towns. And so now you've got this problem of how do you make sure you get the stuff out? And, you know, if you and I pay a bribe to anybody, we go to jail no matter where the bribe is paid. So I'm not going to jail. That's my number one rule. <laughs> you know, I don't want to go to jail. So that that is a problem that has yet to present a solution despite its extraordinary opportunity. And, you know, Mexico City plus all the border cities like Monterey and uh, Guadalajara and the rest, you know, all of those have extraordinary potential, but there's going to have to be some 
either the cartel has to go, we're not going to interrupt this because we see that it's going to be the end of us, you know, or some other signal uh, that that trade is not going to be impacted because people watch what happens with avocados and limes and they're terrified. It's a great point about Mexico. It is such a lost opportunity over the last decades, really, that they didn't try to clean house and create sort of this contract factory business model that China kind of had perfected. Of course, they're now running it into the ground, but it's just such a lost opportunity. From the EU's perspective, you know, Turkey is still very much the textiles capital for if you're buying clothes in Europe, they likely came from Turkey. How does the war affect Turkey? And what are you seeing from EU supply chains from Turkey? And where else is this stuff coming from over there? Well, first, I- India does have a, a better role to play with the EU than the United States, just purely based on the shipping transit times and things like that. And so to the extent that India chooses to be involved, they have a, a higher potential with, with the EU. Turkey remains a very vibrant and huge opportunity. But man, oh man, the geopolitics are one of those things I just can't predict. Like economically, they're, they're a disaster area. And their, their president, literally in the last several days, has basically said, you know, warned the U.S. about things that, like, you should not be talking like that, <laughs> that, you know, and I warned other NATO nations, like, don't do that or else. And these are, uh, these are potential, like, again, unknown outcomes. But I do think Turkey is a really good opportunity to, to build stuff, and they have very good access to multiple routes of raw materials, assuming things can get in through, you know, the war-torn areas. And so I definitely think Turkey is viable. And uh, I, I think if they can keep it together, they really have to get their economy under control, that they'll, they'll do okay. You know, it's just another example of a country's leader taking a dictatorial turn, right? I mean, this was a thriving democracy less than 10 years ago. And there has just been this move, and, and, and President Xi is the same in China, you know, certainly it was communist and it was party rule, but it was much more open. The, this sort of this sort of drive towards autocrats is something that, frankly, I didn't think we would see quite like we're seeing right now, Stephen. It's it seems to be getting worse before it's getting better. I think there's arguments about whether or not it's the system or the person, but what what it comes down to, whether it's the system or the person, it's like whoever it is, they don't want to lose control, and you know, if you're going to stop at nothing and, and you really willing to spend whatever capital or human capital necessary for you to stay in power, that's a that's a pretty bad situation. And this is what leads to some of the desperate, you know, anytime you have war, there's desperation involved. Right. And everybody can figure out who's right and wrong later. But like that is bad for everybody. And I don't think it's the last, you know, kinetic action, as I like to say, because I I just hate thinking about, you know, war. Well, you know, obviously Taiwan is always um, one of those potential bogeys that could literally change the world. And let's hope that that doesn't happen before some of these other uh, conflagrations get resolved. But damn, Steve, I'm a little bit depressed, but you know, (laughs) there's a couple of... (laughs) Yeah, boy, if they've made it this far, boy, they really are gluttons for punishment, huh? (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) You know, the, the, the positive things in here, I love what you said about there's no question that the United States is poised for an onshoring manufacturing renaissance. That's really exciting. I'm hoping against hope that Mexico can get its act together. It's not trending in the right direction right now, but can you imagine what a juggernaut that would be between Canada, the United States, and Mexico if everyone could get their act in order? The framework is there to be able to bring more jobs, more factory, more manufacturing technology back into the United States in a way that benefits everyone, including the climate, you know, depending on which side of that discussion you're on. It just seems like such a win-win. Any specific examples of what you are seeing from the stuff that you're getting made where you're keeping your eye on it and you're thinking maybe down the road here, the fuse finally lets off the big bomb in China, it's over. And, and there could be a significant pickup in manufacturing here in the United States. So for sure, this, this idea that, you know, Mexico has a very good base of people, right? So we talked about people, power, and raw materials. And then the rest of North America has extraordinary raw materials. So we've got what it takes. And because of deglobalization, which we talked about earlier, 
everything's becoming more regionalized, right? So it's just like you described with the EU, they should be focusing on Turkey and, you know, some of the other Eastern Bloc, you know, nations, you know, for some of their production. This will happen with Mexico. I, I assume there's some solution, whether the cartels realize, you know what, if we just kind of get along and keep our stuff out of the, the mainstream. And by the way, that's how they were run for a long time. Like people don't really fully understand this, I think. But, you know, when the cartels realize what's in their best interest, instead of like, it's it's winner take all, Joker's wild, then it, it just, it's a little cleaner. And, and you know, the criminals can chase the, the big money and the drugs and, you know, and they they certainly have the money and they have the capacity to do whatever they want. And the rest of us are like, we're just trying to ship, you know, a barbecue cleaner or, you know, a, a cover for a outdoor chair. All of that can happen. And and I was in a factory at Monterey, Mexico less than a year ago and watching a top brand of products sold on not just on Amazon, but all over the place. Every big box you've ever seen. The engines or the motors for these devices came from China because who else can make 30 million motors? But the rest of it, including the plastic injected mold frames, and all the other pieces were done in Mexico. Not just the assembly, but the manufacturing of everything except the motor. And at the point you can scale up and get the motor done, in Mexico you'll do that too. The, the big companies are, are already doing it. Like people really should understand that. Uh, it's the little guys who get left behind. So to all my you know entrepreneur friends, don't let your finances be at risk. Get terms. And if you're only spending five or ten or twenty thousand at a time. You can still get terms. It's just a little harder because the paperwork costs some money. But if you're doing anything in the six figures, you know, let's say per quarter in orders, you should definitely be on terms. At least six net 60 from the time it ships out of China is a easy term to get right now. By the way, price, currency, term, like all of that is super negotiable right now because China is desperate for orders. So use that leverage. Know that there's a fuse on it. You know, it'll you'll look like a genius until the day it blows up. That's that's how it's going to be. Well, thank you, Steve. As always, this is incredible advice. Your experience is unparalleled. Uh, you know, the world is, a, is, is, the geopolitical situation is a little bit of a dumpster fire right now, but I love how you have pivoted on multiple fronts and multiple geolocations here in order to protect and defend the businesses that you're involved with. And this is amazing advice for our entrepreneurs who are listening. You know, as a reminder, Steve and his group offer free entrepreneurial advice to companies as well as a great podcast at awesomers.com. Steve, you're awesome. Um, thank, you. thank you for providing your regular insights on day two. I feel like we could keep going for two more hours. So we're going to have you back on, Steve, if you'll have, if you'll, if you'll uh, be so kind as to gracious, grace us with your presence. Thank you for all you do for the entrepreneurial community. Thank you for your insights. And thanks again for being our guest. It's a pleasure. Thank you. If you're ready to start growing and protecting your brand on Amazon with a team of experienced Amazon operators, you can visit us at day2podcast.com. That's day the number 2 podcast.com. And lastly, if you know of anyone else who would benefit from this podcast, please share it with them. Thanks for listening and happy selling.